Good afternoon. Welcome on behalf of the Bloomington Bach Cantata Project. My name is Dan Malamud and I'm the director of the project. Uh, glad to see so many of you here, especially taking an hour indoors on a splendid, splendid day like this. So thank you for, thank you for being here. Uh, we are a Bloomington community organization uh, and a, also a project of the musicology and early music programs at the IU Jacobs School of Music. Uh, we are grateful for the support financial support that makes our uh, cantata series possible. We have, if you see in the program, at the bottom of the program page, you will notice that we are now announcing three cantata programs uh, in the spring semester, January, February, and March. I will say that we have raised almost enough funds to guarantee those. So that might be incentive for you to consider, if you haven't, if you haven't yet to help guarantee that those will happen in the same splendid way that the last two have and this one promises to be, uh, consider a donation to the Bloomington Bach Cantata Project. We'd be glad to hear from you. Uh, if you have questions about what we spend the money on or anything else, please do find me afterwards and I'd be glad to talk to you about it. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. 
Herze singt und lässt es sich begnügen an Gottes Vater treu und Huld und hat gebot. Wenn mich ein rote Haar rührt, Gott kann mit seinen Allnachtshänden mein Unglück werden. 
Good afternoon. So, was Bob tut, das ist wohl getan, BWV 99. This is one of those cantatas from, that Bach composed during the second liturgical year he was working in Leipzig. And each of those cantatas, uh, at least until his source of uh, librettos for them ran out, each of those cantatas was based on a seasonal or topical hymn. And as we've heard a number of times right here, uh, the librettist retained the first and last stanzas of the many stanza hymn, and uh, Bach set those to music using the melody associated with that text. The poet paraphrased the inner stanzas of, of the hymn into texts, into poetry suited for setting as modern recitatives and arias. That is, from the uh, old chorale text, uh, produced a modern so-called mixed text libretto from, as I said, an old-fashioned stanza by stanza hymn. Now, Bach and his librettists had a very large repertory of chorales to uh, draw on, and it's always interesting to ask why they picked a particular one. And I want to know that this is not interesting just historically, which of course it is, or even liturgically and theologically, which it also is, but it turns out to have musical consequences, because the choice and the reasons for the choice can help us understand some of Bach's musical decisions in setting this text we can gain some insight into what the music might be telling us. So some, some of the chorale cantatas, some of the cantatas in that annual cycle, uh, are based on seasonal hymns. Nun komm der Heiden Heiland, BWB 62, for the first Sunday in Advent. Galoba Seistu Jesu Christ, BWB 91, for the first day of Christmas. Each setting, in turn, uh, a, an Advent hymn and a Christmas hymn. Christ Lagen Correspondent, BWB 4, adapted, uh, a cantata adapted for Easter, on an Easter hymn. But much more common is the practice of choosing a tune that is topical to the day. That is, meant to resonate with an interpretive theme of the day's gospel reading. And that's the case here with Cantata 99. Now this is worth understanding because the musical setting makes more sense. But the connection uh, is not entirely obvious, I think, to the modern uh, reader of this text and listener to Bach Cantatas. So the hymn is, of course, Was Gott tut, das ist wohl getan. And with its sturdy major key melody, it looks like a hymn of praise for the goodness of everything that God does. But that is not how it was understood in the 17th century when it was written, or in the 18th century when Bach and his librettist made use of it. Um, in the principal Leipzig hymnal of Bach's time there, this chorale, Was Gott tut, das ist wohl getan, is found in a section of chorales on the theme Kreuz und Anfechtung. Now, both of those words are pretty complex terms with deep Lutheran theological implications. Kreuz is literally the cross, of course, but it was used metaphorically by Luther for any kind of suffering that a person endured, the burdens one carried, as in the expression to bear one's own cross. Anfechtung is even more complex. It's simultaneously vexation, temptation, affliction, tribulation. Uh, one writer has explained it as the Lutheran concept of the doubt and terror about one's moral and spiritual position before God. Kreuz und Anfechtung. And that's what this hymn is actually about and was understood to be about. Reassurance that God's doings are good even in the face of one's personal tribulation. You can read this in the first stanza, God knows how to preserve me in times of distress, of nought. And in the last stanza, distress, death, and sorrow may drive me on the rough path, but God will hold me in his arms. The inner stanzas of the hymn, the ones that become paraphrased in the cantata librettos in directions to even arias, are on the same theme, and this theme ends up in the new poetry. God will turn aside my misfortune. God, as metaphorical physician, will not give me poison as a cure for illness. In my sorrow, God has no ill will toward me. And the bitter taste of the cup, another metaphor for bearing life's cross, so it's a metaphor of a metaphor. The bitter taste of that cup is actually imagined. So, a hymn that urges faith in God despite suffering and tribulation. Why, on the 15th Sunday after Trinity, for which this was composed? And the connection is, of course, with the assigned gospel reading. That's a passage from Matthew's Gospel in which Jesus, ur Jesus urges essentially, do not worry. He points to the birds who do not labor, but God feeds them nonetheless. He points to flowers who do not worry about what they will wear, about making clothing or wearing it, 
but God arrays them beautifully anyway, anyway. And it ends, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Es ist genug, dass ein jeglicher Tag seine eigene Plage habe. This most important line is in fact quoted almost literally in the recitative number four, alle Tagen haben gleich ihre eigene Plage. This theme of the gospel reading is what prompted the adoption of this chorale for this Sunday and this cantata. And it's the reason that this particular line is quoted among the, the text that otherwise is mostly just a paraphrase of the hymn. And knowing this can actually help us make sense of Bach's setting. And the two arias are a good place to start. Uh, there's complex metaphor at work here. Uh, the Kreutz, the cross, is itself a metaphor for suffering. And the Kreutz here in this first aria is a bitter cup of medicine administered by God as physician. And the, uh, this um, bitterness hides the ultimate sweetness that's within that cup, that is, for the believer, salvation. This is an inversion of the expected spoonful of sugar that hides medicinal uh, benefits or something, right? It's exactly turned around. That's a very Lutheran way of looking at the world, by the way. Sweet, sweet things hide behind bitter things, and especially bitter things hide behind the apparently sweet. But here it's the first of those two, right? The believing listener is urged in this aria not to be shaken or to shudder at bitterness because its hidden true nature is in fact sweet. Now I would say that even for Bach, this is almost impossible to express musically, right? Instead, what Bach does, I think, is provide you all the elements involved in this complex and theologically abstract metaphor without necessarily trying to make the point directly. And they're mostly present in that beautiful flute ritornello that opens the aria. All this rapid figuration, an emblem, I would say, of agitation, of shaking up, of shuddering. Descending chromaticism, descending by the closest interval. That happens again and again. That's an emblem of sorrow and suffering by convention in early 18th century music. And with it, ascending chromaticism. That's an emulation of, emblem excuse me, of tribulation and difficulty when uh, writers about music feel like putting rhetorical and figurative labels on musical figures, uh, which they did probably less than um, modern pedagogy might uh, suggest by its emphasis, but when they did it, that was called, that ascending chromaticism was called the passus durioscolus. It's the difficult steps, it's the difficult path that, that the music has to walk and that by, uh, by analogy and metaphor, I guess, that the, that the believer here does. So the text presents the elaborate metaphor here with the sweetness and the bitterness and the cup and the croix and so on. Um, but the ritornello and the vocal imitation of it providing the text supply the affect, uh, supply the emotional context here. The second aria makes a related point in a similarly elaborate metaphor uh, where appearance and reality again differ. The bitterness of life's tribulations, kreutze, appear unbearable because of flesh's weakness. But assuming that they're unbearable is a false presumption, the aria says. You have to believe that it is endurable and it is God's good doing, despite the fact that it represents suffering, represents Christ. So this is another set of concepts that I would argue is very difficult to present musically. Again, we have a ritornello that supplies various elements. We have two instruments and then eventually two voices in imitation of each other probably invoking the two elements clashing with each other that the text speaks of, without being especially literal about it. You have an imitative subject with a repeated note. And that kind of repeated note is often an emblem of um, insistence, which I think fits here. And then it's full of sighing figures. A dissonant strong beat in its resolution on the weak beat and more descending chromatic lines, emblems of suffering. All these elements come together um, to uh, represent the various concepts involved in this abstract and theological point that the text is making. There are two recitatives uh, in this cantata, both so-called simple recitatives, using only basso continuo, and they're closely parallel. And as often, the last line of the recitative text is set with a steady rhythm and an active bass line, in contrast to what's gone before, which is speech-like rhythms punctuated occasionally by the bass instrument. 
And here it's striking that Bach ends the two recitatives with almost identical material. That does not happen very often. Uh, he focuses attention on the parallel statements that are in fact on this textual theme. In the second movement, God can turn misfortune around. And in the fourth movement, the second of those recitatives, God's faithfulness is manifested after suffering. So there Bach underlines, and the librettist has provided him the opportunity to underline that theme as it comes up and is paraphrased in those two recitatives there. Now, the opening movements of cantatas from this cycle are typically choral settings. There are a few severe old-style settings, uh, chorale motets, with instruments that just double the voices. But most of the opening movements are pieces modeled on the Italian instrumental concerto. Uh, this begins, of course, with the creation of an instrumental ritornello, a passage that's going to return multiple times. That ritornello uh, alternates with solo passages in a concerto. The ritornello comes back in various keys, sometimes complete, sometimes not, and then returns in the home key at the very end to round off the piece. Bach's typical way of adapting ritornello concerto technique for chorale setting is to um, have the chorale tune and the accompanying voices, so usually the one voice will sing the tune, here the soprano, and supporting lower voices. The chorale tune and the accompanying voices present the chorale melody phrase by phrase in place of the solo passages in a concerto. So instead of as an instrumental concerto, you get Ritornell alternating Ritornello soloist, Ritornello soloist, Ritornello soloist in the simplest scheme of these. Here you, in principle, in most of these pieces, you get Ritornello chorale phrase in place of soloist, Ritornello chorale phrase, Ritornello, and so on, closing with the final Ritornello. This is much like an aria, in fact. And arias are also most typically Ritornello forms with the voice in the role of the solo instrument. But this is not quite what happens in our opening movement here. It's got a pretty typical opening ritornello, and when it reaches its conclusion, and I'm sure you recognize the syntax is so familiar from having heard many concertos and many arias and many cantata movements, when the ritornello reaches its conclusion, we expect the entrance of the voices with that first chorale phrase. Instead, we get the solo flute and solo oba d'amore coming in. This is actually a double instrumental concerto, a concerto for solo flute and solo oboe d'amore. The voices are then added in as a sort of afterthought over that first solo passage. But not always. The second chorale phrase is sung not over a solo passage, but by the concluding phrase of the ritornello when it comes back. And this relationship changes all the time through the movement. Sometimes the ritornello is put over solo material, and sometimes it's put over uh, tutti, ritornello material, played by the whole ensemble. To make this even more complicated, Bach is always interested in blurring the identity of solo and tutti. If you know any Bach concertos, if you listen for this point, you'll hear they're not simply alternating ritornello, solo, ritornello, solo. They find ways to share material, overlap, and so on. Um, here you got another complication in the varying use of voices. If you're trying to follow this movement from that point of view, it's actually quite busy because Bach has got so many different elements going here at once. The result is a movement that reads as a duo concerto for the two woodwind instruments, um, and that it reads more as a duo concerto to me than it does as a Ritornello chorale setting. And I think the point is that it, Bach intends this movement to be heard as both simultaneously. Now we've heard several cantatas right here in this room that begin with instrumental symphonias. And some of those instrumental symphonias have even been reworked movements that Bach adapts from his own concerto repertory. Now Bach doesn't tend to do this when the opening vocal movement is a ritornello chorus. I think that probably would have been heard as redundant to have a big ritornello concerto movement and then a big ritornello choral movement. I mean, that's just a guess, but that's my, that's my instinct. Here, Bach solves this problem by combining the two types. He departs from his usual use of concerto technique in a cantata featuring voices and orients the movement around solo instruments. He adds a vocal chorale to it. Further evidence, I think, that Bach was looking for new ways to approach this type, this chorale cantata type, every time he came back to it, week after week after week after week. Now, those solo instruments, especially the flute, play a big role in this cantata. In the opening movement, of course, as we just discussed, number three is, of course, a flute, uh, an aria with flute obligato, and number five, the second aria, is an aria with flute and oboe obligato. And so, very loosely speaking, this cantata is a sort of three-movement flute and oboe concerto for the 15th Sunday after Trinity. Now, we don't know what prompted Bach to do this, uh, this for this particular piece in 1725, 
But I have to admit I was not all that surprised when our music director proposed this cantata. Uh, and I have to say I'm very glad she did. Thank you. <laughs>
Mein Unglück wäre 